Welcome everyone to Gamer Meld. Today I've got some really shocking stories to cover, starting with a major issue with this motherboard. Nvidia's new ultra expensive GPU loses to this, Intel announced their next gen monster CPUs, and the first benchmarks on AMD's upcoming Ryzen X 3D parts. Okay, it's news time, and first up for today, we have a pretty wild story about a Zeus effectively making a major issue with one of their motherboards. More specifically, it's the Zeus ROG Z690 formula, and it's the optional EK VRM block that kind of messes everything up. For those who don't know, it's basically a water cooling block for your VRMs that effectively water cools them. Now, obviously, this isn't necessary or anything like that. It's absolutely overkill, but it can be pretty fun for people who are into water cooling. Well, it looks like users are beginning to discover a pretty major flaw with this VRM block. As you can see right here, there's some massive corrosion going on here. And whenever we look at some other images, we can see more corrosion. I mean, look at this. Absolutely absurd. Tons of corrosion. Well, it looks like we may have found out exactly why. You can see that Tech Power Up mentions, based on Asus's official advertisement of nickel plated and EK's involvement, everyone assumed that the materials used were nickel plated copper. But it turns out, at least from what we're seeing, it looks like it's more than likely nickel plated aluminum. And for those who don't know, mixing metals is a big no no. Basically, when you mix metals and add electrolytes from, say, water, you end up getting something called galvanic corrosion. This is something that's very well known in boating, especially saltwater boating, because whenever you add the acidity of the saltwater, it really makes that reaction go pretty wild. But basically, one of the metals ends up eating the other. I'm also pretty sure, if I remember correctly, that there were some issues back in the day with the Statue of Liberty actually coming into contact with some of the beams that were holding it up, which ultimately started having it to corrode and they had to do something really fast before it effectively collapsed. Basically, this is something that's very well known if you are in these industries and if you're dealing with waters and metals, this is just flat a massive no-no. And apparently Zeus is aware of it, but instead of making an announcement, it looks like they're just emailing people who just so happen to email them because they noticed this issue. As you can see down here, it says, unfortunately, EK and Zeus have discovered the issue of the VRM block corrosion. We are already working closely to address this issue and offer support to all affected customers. Apparently, Zeus is readying an adequate replacement hybrid VRM thermal solution for everyone affected by this issue. And of course, that is good and all, but at the same time, what ends up happening with this is that it may end up affecting your entire system not just the water block because when they corrode and things begin breaking off they can end up obstructing water flow and things like that in your custom loop so this is a major issue and it's pretty wild that a zeus allowed this to happen ultimately i think a zeus needs to address this publicly and apologize and make it right let everyone know that has this system that this can and almost certainly will happen to you. And especially given the price that they paid for these boards, for this to happen is flat out unacceptable. And next up for today, we have a really interesting story about Nvidia's newest RTX 6000 ADA GPU. For those who don't know, that ADA GPU is a whopping $6,800. Well, as you can see right here, it actually gets beat in most content creation workloads by the $1,599 RTX 4090. When we move down here, we can see that Puget Systems actually ran numerous benchmarks with this new GPU, and they did some comparisons. And as you can see, while we go through these, the 4090 ultimately wins. Here you can see that they're pretty much neck and neck with the 4090 losing in DaVinci Resolve Studio. Then when we move to Adobe Premiere Pro, we can see that the 4090 ends up winning here. It loses here, but then it has a streak of wins. Unreal Engine, it ends up winning by quite a bit over the RTX 6000. V-Ray, it wins. Octane Render, it wins. 
Redshift, it's pretty much neck and neck, although it does lose here, but then it wins again in Blender. Basically, this is pretty wild given the price difference of the card. You would definitely think that the 6,080 Lovelace GPU would completely beat it in everything, especially since it does have quite a bit more cores. With that said, it does have a much lower TDP. I believe it's like 300 versus the over 400 watt TDP of the 4090. But with that, don't forget that we're literally talking talking 1600 bucks versus a whopping $6,800. Now, with that said, there are still gonna be some benefits for the RTX 6000 cards. Specifically, you're gonna get drivers that are gonna be a lot more reliable for the RTX 6000 cards, as well as certain things that Nvidia likes to kind of gimp in performance for other workloads. But if these are the kind of things that you're doing, I would definitely take a hard look at the RTX 4090. And next up, Intel just announced their next-gen Xeon processors for workstations. And this is actually a really interesting release because it allows overclocking, which essentially means that this is also their HEDT processors. So think of their Core X series that they released a while back. This is effectively the update to that and obviously would be going against AMD's Threadripper CPUs. As you can see right here, they mention a few things that these are good for, media and entertainment, life sciences, engineering, energy and geosciences, data science and AI development, and financial services. When we move over here, we actually get into the CPUs themselves. These are actually broken up into two series of processors, the W3400 and W2400. And as you can see, they are also separated by TDP with the 3400 processors at 350 watts and the 2400 at 225 watts. Moving on, you can see that it is the socket LGA4677 for the W790 chipset. And right here, you can see that they actually have unlocked processors and of course that means that you can overclock them so this is a really exciting release and not only that you'll quickly notice that these get up to 56 cores of course amd's threadripper still has these beat but you'll actually find out that the pricing at least compared to amd's threadripper isn't all that bad when we look to the cpus themselves we can see that the highest in SKU, the 56 core 112 CPU is called the W93495X. As you can see, the top end model comes with 105 megabytes of L3 cache, up to DDR5 4800 memory speed. It comes with eight channel memory support, as well as up to four terabytes. So definitely pretty impressive there. Now, really quickly, you will notice that it's only this top end one that has a 350 watt base power. As we move down, obviously that does go down, but of course this is the base power wattage. So each one likely goes quite a bit higher than that. When we look at clocks, we can see that the 56 core gets up to 4.8 gigahertz, but that is very much something that needs an asterisk by it because the actual base frequency of these is 1.9. So they obviously crammed a ton of cores in here, but at only 1.9 gigahertz. Moving down, we have a 36 core, 72 thread part, 28 core, 56 thread, 24 core, 48 threads, 20 core, 40 threads, 16 core, 32, and then finally 12 core, 24. Though whenever I say finally, I just mean on the 3400 processors. But anyway, as you can see, when we get down here, that base frequency significantly gets higher. Basically, as usual, like we see with these really high core count CPUs, as you up the cores more and more, you drastically have to lower your base frequency. Moving on to the 2400 processors, we can see that these start at 24 cores and 48 threads, with the highest model getting 45 megabytes of L3 cache and a 2.5 gigahertz base clock. Not only that, but while they do still offer the higher DDR5 4800, the channels moves down to four and you only get up to a maximum of two terabytes. Finally, when it comes to performance, one thing you will notice is that in these slides, Intel does not compare any of these processors to AMD's Threadripper processors. Instead, they're just comparing it to other Intel chips. And of course, that could mean something from what I'm seeing. I mean, we definitely see higher clocks and even lower TDP on AMD's Threadripper parts. But of course, we'll have to see how they stack up when they're released. And lastly for today, we're finally starting to see some benchmarks leak 
for AMD's upcoming Ryzen 7000 X 3D parts. This first one right here you can see is in Geekbench and it's a little bit of a bummer but don't worry I actually have one in a game in just a second but first let's kind of go over this one. As you can see down here video cards actually gives us a nice comparison to do it versus the 7950X but we can see that this is in Geekbench 5. We can see that the single core score was 2,157 and it got a multi-core score of 21,841. Now, when we compare that to the 7950X, we can see that the single core score is ever so slightly lower. We're talking just a couple percent here, easily within the margin of error. But when we move over to multi-core, we can see that it actually got around a 5% dip when compared to the 7950X. And there's actually a Blender one down here as well. And from what I've seen from that, I believe it's right around 5% slower as well. And of course, the question of that is why? Well, I actually think there's a really good answer. When we look right here, you can actually see that only one of the dies has the 3D V cache. The other one is just a normal die that you'd see on the 7950X. As for why they did that, we'll have to see when these come out, but basically that is how you're able to see things like the boost clock being exactly the same as the 7950X. And at the same time, you have a lower TDP. Basically, only one of these modules have cores that can get that high. Remember, when the 5800X 3D came out, it was a little bit slower in multi-threaded workloads. And of course, the more cores you have that are slower, the more of a difference you're going to have. But, and this is one of the reasons why I think AMD did this, if you have one of them that can get just as high clocks as the 7950X 3D, only half of the cores are going to be a little bit slower. So you're not going to see a massive difference in multi-core performance or anything like that, only just a few percent like we're seeing here. But of course, these are more made for gaming and here is where we actually have our first gaming benchmark. Unlike the last benchmark, this one is on the Ryzen 9 7900 X3D. And as you can see, it is on Ashes of the Singularity. And when we go down here, we can see from Tom's Hardware, they actually were able to find something similar with a regular 7900X and according to what they found, they actually saw that the 3D V-Cache model was a whopping 87.5% faster. So we're talking a massive uplift over the non-3D V-Cache model. With that said, I will at least go ahead and say to take this with a grain of salt because Ashes of the Singularity really isn't that great of a benchmark when you're doing these kind of comparisons. It at least can kind of give us a little something to go off of, but we've seen in the past that things can kind of differentiate pretty wildly on there already. But with an 87.5% boost, we should at least be able to expect a pretty decent upgrade with these new chips. So while that does it for today, are you pumped for AMD's upcoming Ryzen 7000 X 3D parts? Let me know down in the comments below. And if you liked the video, please subscribe. And as always, have a great day.